Hi, and welcome to episode number 70 of the weekly Google Cloud Platform podcast. I am Francis Campoy, and I'm here with my colleague, Mark Mandel. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, Francis. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, pretty good. Uh, still, second week of relaxing time after next, you know, uh, uh. feeling relaxed and <laughs> planning on new stuff. Today, we have a very cool interview that we're rescuing from the uh, Cloud Next 2017 conference floor. Yep. Uh, we got the chance to meet, well, actually, I had met him before, but I don't think you met him no. before. Yeah, so we met uh, with Brad Brzezinski, uh, who uh, is the creator of Drone CI, uh, and we got the chance to talk about how it works. And Drone CI is, for those that don't know, it's a continuous integration, continuous deployment platform that is based on containers. And since Jesse Frizzell was walking around... She was just around. We figured we'd just pull her in and be like, hey, you want to come join us? Yeah, so she joined us. So we have today an interview with both Brad Brzezinski and Jesse Frizzell, which yeah. was pretty awesome. It was pretty awesome. And once we're done with that, we've got our question of the week all about protobufs. Yep. Why should we use protocol buffers? Why is this thing cool? And like, what is it useful for? Yeah, and the question is actually coming from someone that came to meet us at the uh, GCE podcast booth at CloudNext. So all CloudNext related things today. Exactly. Uh, so before we get into our interviews and our questions of the week, why don't we talk through our cool things of the week? Yeah. So the first one that you brought is for Google Cloud Dataflow, which I, I love. Uh, it's an amazing platform to basically do like flows of data. <laughs> yeah, big streaming piles of data and doing real-time like analytics or ETL or all yeah. sorts of other fun stuff to it as it comes through. The only thing I didn't like <laughs> is that you had to write Java for it, and I've, I've done it, Yep, but it's not the case anymore. Well, so you could write Python on Dataflow for a while, but it is now generally available. Yep. So uh, you can go hack on that, and you have SLAs and all the good stuff, uh, which is pretty cool. So you can build pipelines on, say, Apache Beam as well, which is the open source version of Dataflow uh, within Python, as well as do them directly on Dataflow. And so you can do all your data needs and analytic needs on Dataflow using Python under general availability. Go have at it and have lots of fun. <laughs> nice. And there's, uh, if you're more interested on uh, Dataflow, we had an episode, episode number 30, where we talked about gaming analytics uh, and we, we talked a little bit more in detail what Dataflow is. But I guess that at some point we should do an episode. We on should. Dataflow. Yeah. Yep. As soon as they get support for Go. Hello. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, the second cool thing of the week. Actually, the second and the third one are related both to SQL. Yeah. So this one's mine too. Uh, so this is kind of cool. This was a blog post that's on the Big Data and Machine Learning blog talking about how you can use R. I have to think about that because I'm Australian. I can't say R. Uh, <laughs> I say uh. R. Uh, R, the programming language, commonly used for scientific, numerical, analytic, statistical, uh, data crunching, and providing plots and whatnot uh, for the data. Uh, how to connect that up to the Cloud SQL, the MySQL edition, so that you can pull data out of your Cloud SQL systems and do statistical analysis on it, build graphs, build diagrams, all that cool stuff, so your data scientists can have loads of fun with your Cloud SQL data. Nice. Uh I have two jokes. Do you know what's the favorite language of pirates? R. And do you know how to say R in Spanish? No. R. Oh. Try it. <laughs> R. Eh, that's actually not. Yeah. Is that okay. All right? Yeah. You'll take it. All right. That's that's this one. Thank Good. you. Uh, okay. So the the last cool thing of the week for today is uh, again Cloud SQL. Yep. But this uh, PostgreSQL is not MySQL. Uh, as you know, we announced that uh, during Cloud Next, and there's a blog post written about how you can use it for uh, geospatial applications. And and I think it's very interesting because it actually comes uh, from our friends in the Card Labs. Yeah, we had them before. Uh, we had them specifically one episode. Uh, we had Kim, Tim Kelton on episode 41. Mm -hmm. and, and they do a lot of really cool things with maps. Uh, and now they're talking about how they actually do this and how do the queries about like, oh, how do I find these things in the map? Storing all the information on uh, PostgreSQL with Cloud SQL. So it's a very interesting blog post with a lot of really interesting detail, a lot of cool graphs and maps and diagrams. So if you're interested on uh, geospatial applications and specifically SQL, MySQL or PostgreSQL, go check it out. Awesome. Well, why don't we go chat with our friends Brad and Jesse and Let see what they're up to. Let's do that. 
We're now joined by Brad Brzezki, uh here on still the floor of Cloudnext in Moscone West in San Francisco, beautiful California. Uh, and I'm very happy to welcome here. Uh, hello, Brad. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, why, why, uh, why are you here? Who are you? <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. I mean, so I'm an open source developer. I work primarily on an open source project called Drone. It focuses on container-based continuous delivery. So uh, it integrates with Google Cloud Platform and mm -hmm. uh, many of the um, many of my you know open source community members use uh, Google Cloud Platform. So it's a great opportunity uh, to be here and learn about the platform. Cool. Um, I'm I'm also pretty excited, and I have to admit something. I'm a huge fan of yours. Um, we have a guest host here as well, uh, Jesse Frizzell. How are you doing? Uh, I'm good. I just gave my talk, so now I'm super relaxed. <laughs> yeah, basically, we decided that we're going to be talking a little bit about containers at some point. So in case that we say anything wrong, Jesse can just like shout at us or something. Yeah, <laughs> I'm totally okay with that. Yep. So let's talk a little bit of, more about Drone. You said it's a continuous delivery product or ser service. What is it exactly? What is the difference with others, like, I don't know, like Travis or Jenkins? Sure. I think the biggest difference is that Drone is built from the ground up to use containers as the build runtime. Uh, specifically, right now, it uses Docker. So every single build and build step executes in a Docker container itself. And the configuration is defined as a superset of the Docker Compose YAML. So it's really a container-first solution. So this project, is it open source? Is it hosted? What's the, the idea there? Yeah, it's completely open source. It's on GitHub. You can find it at github.com slash drone slash drone. Awesome. Um, and, but Drone's also a business as well, is that correct? Yeah, so it started out as a service um, where, you know, a, a subscription service similar to a lot of the other ones out there. But right now we focus mostly on open source and on-premise and, and enterprise. Cool. And before we get into the details on how it is implemented, What's the name Drone? The idea with the name Drone came from you know, this idea that it was automated, that you had something controlling and executing your, your builds in an automated fashion, you know, kind of from like a central source, like that, that Borg source. Uh, I think that's a name you guys are familiar with, uh, <laughs> Google. Borg, yeah, yeah. maybe. Bit, <laughs> you know, it, it was also, the name came like five years ago, maybe when it was a little less of a controversial term, and then it just kind of stuck. <laughs> And, uh, you know, domain names are hard to come by, so I just wasn't interested in, in changing at that point. So Cool. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, exactly how Drone works. Like you said, there's an open source uh, project, so you can run it anywhere. Where are people running it? How do you run it? Sure. Well, um, Drone is built in Go, so it compiles down to a nice small uh, binary that has no external runtime dependencies. It ships in like a 15 megabyte Docker scratch image. So it's really easy to get up and running. Um, and you can really run it anywhere you want, on any, uh, on any cloud, on, on your, uh, you know, within your data center, on your own infrastructure. Uh, there are, it's, it's a really portable system. Now, I think we were talking about as well that before, before the episode, you run it, you, most people run it on Kubernetes, or a lot of people do? Yeah, I mean, I think it's incredible. You know, I remember a, a year or two ago, Kubernetes came up somewhat frequently. I think now within the drone community, almost every day someone is installing drone on Kubernetes. Uh, I'm blown away. And I think as a result, we're spending a lot more time trying to uh, integrate with Kubernetes uh, and make that a more seamless experience. Cool. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, why Kubernetes? Maybe, uh, maybe Jesse knows about this. <laughs> why, like, why do you think Kubernetes would be a good environment to run such a thing as Drone? Uh, yeah, I think a lot of people actually use uh, Kubernetes most of the time for CI processes because you have a bunch of jobs, you don't really care on which nodes they run, you just need to get it somewhere and it needs to complete. Um, so having just like the basic scheduler there um, to handle a bunch of jobs for your corporation or something um, is super nice. I'm sure the isolation is also a nice factor, too. Oh, yeah, of course, because <laughs> containers isolate. And then you kind of have peace of mind that team two is not messing with team one. <laughs> um, so uh, whenever I think about a bunch of different tasks that need to be processed, especially for Kubernetes, the first thing that comes to mind is the jobs API. Uh, are you using it? So right now, we, we initially started looking at the jobs API. 
And one of the suggestions we got was instead of using the jobs API was to create custom namespaces, uh, one for each build, and then inside that namespace spin up uh, pods with persistent volumes, and then for each step in the pipeline, creating a new pod. Um, so for those people who aren't familiar, and I'll defer to you just, what's a namespace? Like, what does that mean? Yeah, so Kubernetes has this concept of namespaces where um, you can almost segregate how your cluster is defined in terms of where things are running um, and how they run in terms of interactions with other containers. So when you namespace something, you're kind of blocking off network traffic, stuff like that, from interacting with another namespace. And where we're even getting to in the future is where your security model could be the namespace as a boundary, which is why it would actually be great for a drone in this case, because then maybe even multi-tenant jobs not in the same company could be run on Kubernetes uh, as a CI, which would be really cool. So basically, you could say that it's kind of like a, a uh, one more layer, one more layer of isolation. Like containers provide a layer, a uh, layer of isolation. Uh, namespaces is like the second one on top. Yeah, uh, it's just the more abstract um, layer in terms of uh, instead of like isolation from you know the like system calls of Linux and stuff like yeah. that. You're just like one more layer up of it's isolating the parts of Kubernetes that you don't want to interact. I think the interesting thing too about namespaces, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Jesse, but my understanding is if you delete the namespace, it cleans everything up. So from a CI perspective, it's oh, really nice, nice yeah. because you don't have to worry about you know a pipeline might have ten or fifteen steps. Uh, all creating and spawning containers. So the fact that you can just, with one API call, wipe all that out and not worry about leaving artifacts around on the system is really nice, uh, at least from an integration standpoint. Probably also means you're, you're less likely to accidentally wipe off something you shouldn't be wiping off. <laughs> yeah, that's genius, actually. I didn't think of that as a feature. It's like a hidden feature there. Yes. Yeah. I didn't know that was a thing. I'm actually now really excited about it. That's yeah. cool. Credit credit goes to Kelsey because he's the one that told me to uh, that that's what I should be doing. So Dear coworker Kelsey Hightower, hello. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so now I'm also just curious. Like you said that for using drone, uh, you write a Docker Compose file. What is the developer like experience like when they use drone? Sure. Um, I mean, drone supports a lot of different workflows, but I think the most interesting is, uh, you know, drone uses like I said, a superset of Docker Compose, and in many ways behaves like Docker Compose. So you can actually run your build locally uh, just by running drone exec, and it'll spin up, you know, let's say you're using Docker for Mac, it'll spin up and run your build in isolation locally. So gone are the days where you're pushing to your CI server, seeing it fail, updating your YAML, pushing, you know, and, and kind of rinse and repeat, doing that over and over uh, and banging your head against the wall. I've done um, that. <laughs> so yeah, I think it starts with that, and. Uh, a lot of individuals really like that that workflow. So then, when you push to something like um, you know uh, GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab, Drone supports many different providers. Right now, everything gets in queued, and Drone will pull down the builds uh, onto one or many machines uh, and execute the build by interacting directly with the Docker host, spinning up those containers. And so the nice thing is you have a level of determinism because. The build that you executed from the command line on your machine runs the exact same way um, in your CI environment on your servers. Nice. Um, I think it's it's time to go a little bit more into the, the architecture. You mentioned that it is running Go. Yay. Uh, you also mentioned that it was basically just like a Docker container. Everything was running on containers. You can run it very easily on uh, Kubernetes. What are the other dependencies that you have? Is there any other dependencies like, I don't know, like what do you do for storage or communication across containers? Sure. So in terms of dependencies, the most important thing, in my opinion, with Drone is that it ships as a single binary with no hard external dependencies other than a container runtime. And so that's important because no one wants to download and install open source software and then have to install 10 other pieces of open source software. Um, but that being said, you know, using Go and you know, Go makes it really easy to do abstractions with interfaces. Uh, one of the goals is to ship drone with built-in modules like a queue, like PubSub, like log streaming, but to allow you to swap those out with something, and I'm going to use this buzzword, but something more cloud native. <laughs> so yeah, I know, right? Uh, everyone's <laughs> laughing. Um, but I, I think that's. You know, and it's one of those terms that's thrown around a lot, and it's kind of lost a little bit of meaning. But for me, what I what I want with something that's considered cloud native is, you know, you install it, uh, you install the software, you're running it, but you can swap out modules with things that are going to scale that you don't have to worry about. 
So for example, drone ships with a, an internal in-memory queue, um, but you can, using Go and using interfaces, you can swap it out very easily with Google Cloud PubSub. Nice. And so I was gonna ask, you said like using Go, using interfaces, is that using like the Go 1.8 plugin system or like how are you actually switching out from one to the other? So right now we provide um, those uh, baked in. So right now if you're using drone, you can use the in-memory queue or the cloud pub sub queue. Uh, those are the only two we offer. Uh, you know, maybe we'll look at the plugins. Um, you know, it's a great and interesting new feature. So it's something we'll definitely look into. So are you configuring that through like an environment variable yeah, or exactly. is that how it works? You okay, cool. a few environment variables and then you're good to go. And so then we can do that, you know, with other modules um, in terms of, you know, you, you got the queue, now you have logging. Uh, drone has an in-memory log multiplexer. You can use stack driver logging. Um, you can do that with the event bus. You can use PubSub. Uh, and another goal is maybe using Kubernetes as the back end instead of in-memory uh, or, or local Docker. Nice. And once you start doing, uh, once you're able to basically break that, I'm going to use the word monolith. <laughs> Uh, that monolith that you, you mentioned that you have like one si single static binary built with Go uh, into more pieces, uh, I guess that you're also thinking about the fact that you can scale some of the pieces independently of the rest. Uh, what are your plans on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the goal is, is letting the developer choose, pick and choose what they want to scale. Uh, or maybe as, as drone grows, it can kind of grow with them by leveraging Google Cloud and, and the services it provides. I'm curious about uh, Jesse's opinion on uh, the definition of cloud native, because I know that <laughs> she has opinions on this. So uh, what is cloud native for you? Um, I was actually just going to joke that if you say that one more time, Eric Brewer is going to show up here. Cloud native. <laughs> Hello, Eric. <laughs> Where is he? Where is he? Um, He's probably somewhere around here. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> just such a buzzword. Um, I think that it's just honestly anything that you can deploy in the cloud easily, um, which is a lot of things. And I think people just kind of throw that around. Um, but also things that are built into tools that are the cloud, like using PubSub, using uh, integrations into Google Cloud itself is super cloud native. Um, but yeah, I feel like a salesperson right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. I think we need to take it one step further. I think that's what cloud native I would have said it one more time, sorry. <laughs> I think that's what it should be. I think it's it's all about integrating with those built-in services that Google Cloud Platform or you know maybe uh, you know other providers have to offer to give you that extra scalability and maintainability and I wish we were more strict with the term so that's kind of how I use it. Do you look at it also from the perspective of it's it's an elastic Right? If you build certain apps in certain ways, like they're very hard to scale because they might have dependencies on other things. But you look at things like 12-factor apps, that kind of stuff. I think of that as well when I think cloud native. Like I've built my app such that if it lives in the cloud, I can have 1,000 servers, I can have 2,000, I could have 10, it doesn't matter. Yeah, and the scalability of it and the fact that you can tear it down, spin it up, um, a lot of that I think comes from containers, but um, being able to just like clean slate, just start from nothing and go from everything is huge. So, last time we talked about drone uh, here on the podcast was because it was a cool thing of the week, uh, which was because the New York Times, uh, they created, uh, is it a plugin uh, for drone so you can deploy stuff directly to Apache and Container Engine? Correct. Yeah, so Drone has a really nice plugin system where uh, every step in the pipeline is a container, and that includes uh, plugins themselves. So writing plugins is as simple as putting a Bash uh, script in a container, uh, so they can be you know really any language, and, and there's a really low barrier to entry. So the New York Times created a number of plugins, including Kubernetes plugins, uh, and Drone actually has probably about five or six different Kubernetes plugins that uh, work with Kubernetes in in different ways, some more simple and some more advanced. So what is the whole idea behind this? It means that I can basically have my YAML file that you were mentioning at the beginning and at some point just say, whenever there's a new change in my repo, uh, this is going to call drone, it's going to create a new image, new deployment. Yeah, correct. So it'll, um, you know, they're using, we have plugins for uh, Google Container Registry. So in the case of the New York Times, they were pushing to Google Container Registry and they had a simple plugin to do that. And then once it was in the registry, uh, they use the Kubernetes plugin uh, and a spec file, and they use that to automatically 
push the new image to Kubernetes and auto deploy it to a, a number of different instances. And I've even seen uh, teams where they were um, deploying pull requests. So they Ooh, want nice. to oh, like to smoke test, test it. Or, yeah, yeah to nice. smoke test it. And so you can do some really interesting things there. There's a lot of interesting options. Well, from those plugins like that, and you were talking about having the PubSub integration, are there any plans going forward to be more integrated with Google Cloud Platform? What's the plans there? I think ideally, you know, all those different modules we talked about, which is queuing, which is uh, eventing, logging, you know, those are all common with a CI system. You'll find them in any CI system. And I would love to be able to kind of hot swap out those with the, you know, Google Cloud Platform features. And one of the biggest ones is I want to be able to launch builds on Kubernetes itself. So instead of interacting directly with the Docker daemon, we can use the Kubernetes scheduler oh, nice. to launch builds. So there's been a bunch of announcements. There's been all sorts of cool stuff going on. What have been some highlights for you from the conference? I think one of the biggest highlights was um, the community summit, which gave us a chance to kind of connect with a lot of other members in the community, open source developers, and you know get some insight into the the vision behind Google Cloud. And I think as an open source maintainer, the the thing I want most is or look forward most is Google's commitment to openness. Uh, you know. I think it's it's awesome that Kubernetes is being developed in the open and, and given to the CNCF Foundation, and I'm really interested to see how much further Google can take that. You know, as an open source developer, I want to integrate with Google, but I want to integrate. Uh, you know, I want to make sure I'm not locking customers in. So I'm really interested to see how Google will take you know openness to a next level in its cloud. That was a, a highlight for me on the keynote when we were like. Yeah, we want to be open. We want to have you land here. We want to have you able to leave. But you know, we want to take our chances on the fact that we're just going to be the best place for you to stay. And I, I, that, that's a that's a philosophy that's definitely near and dear to my heart. Yeah. Uh, similar question, but for Jesse, uh, you've been here at the uh, at the conference also three days already. Uh, what was your favorite moment? Or favorite um, announcement or whatever. I guess I have two. So my favorite moment was that the keynote today was all about uh, like open source and being open, and I obviously love that stuff. But then I liked the announcement that Erst gave with regard to the uh, security chip for verifying the BIOS of the servers. I think that like it's really cool that Google has this opportunity since we control the hardware to do that, which not a lot of people have, and it's super dope. Yeah, we interviewed uh, Cornelius Willis and Neil Mueller from uh, from Google Cloud marketing team uh, exactly about that, and we were able to actually touch one of the those Titan chips. I, I tried. Tiny. I tried putting one in my ear. That's Didn't so cool. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, well, we're sort of almost running out of time. But is there anything else we haven't talked about that you want to mention before we wrap things up regarding drone or cloud native or cloud native? Or maybe all the client native or uh, cloud next. <laughs> Serverless, just kidding. So, oh, oh, <laughs> she went there. <laughs> um, I, I think the only thing maybe worth mentioning that I'm really excited about is you know, I mentioned that we were taking all these components and modules in drone and extending them and, and actually pulling them out of drone. And the cool thing is, as we do that, it gives you the ability to compose your own CI system. So you can actually, you know, if, if you've ever had, you know, wanted to scratch your own itch and build that CI system, but you didn't want to build your own queue, your own message bus, your own logger, inter integrate with Docker, integrate with Kubernetes, uh, your own YAML format, you can actually pick and choose uh, those modules and compose your own in a surprisingly small amount of code. And cool. all of this code is, uh, as we said, open source. and was yep. github.com slash drone slash drone. Yes. Perfect. Cool. And that's the perfect place for people to get involved. They should just go to the GitHub. Yeah, absolutely. Log tons of issues. Just Great. kidding. <laughs> uh, what about you, Jesse? Anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no. That's all, yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for taking the time out of your Cloud Next experience to share your experience with us. This was fun. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. An enormous thank you to Brad and Jesse for joining us. Uh, Brad, great conversation about CI, CD systems, containers. Jesse, always a delight to have on the podcast. Uh, really interesting stuff. I really like uh, testing and testing infrastructure and making sure that people do that sort of stuff. Um, obviously, I think a lot of us do, but like having those infrastructure tools available to people as open source products means that we can all build really good systems. Yeah, also the explanation on namespaces, uh, I actually did not know much about it, so uh, that was very interesting. 
Uh, okay, so let's go with the question of the week. And the question of the week comes from this guy that came uh, get a podcast T-shirt from mm -hmm. the GCP uh, podcast booth at Cloud Next. His name is Rokesh, Rokesh Janki. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Unlike you, misspelled your name in the email you sent me. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so his question is like, okay, so what is protocol buffers? And why should we all start using it? Yeah, what is Protobuf? So it is another open source project that came from Google. It's actually been around for a long time. What you can basically uh, take from it is it's, it's an IDL. It's an interface definition language. So you write these proto files. Uh, and from those proto files, you're able to basically take the data that is de defined in those proto files and send it across the wire in, in a variety of different languages. And it's a binary format that goes across the wire. Yeah. So it's nice and small, very performant, um, and super, super cool that way. The nice thing is it's contract first. So you're writing this interface definition language. Uh, your sender and your receiver both have an understanding of exactly the data they should be getting and receiving. Um, so that's hugely powerful. But it also gives you nice things like versioning. So if your data changes, you don't have to worry about it as much between the sender and receiver and do all sorts of fun stuff like that. Yeah, just to give an idea of how important this thing is, uh, we use it at Google for virtually everything. Yep. Whatever we encode anything in files, it's always protocol buffers. Wherever we're sending data over the network, it's always protocol buffers. So it is basically, we do not use JSON internally that much. Instead, we use protocol buffers. So you can see it like a more efficient and uh, easier to collaborate way of sending data around. If you're going to play with protocol buffers, I would definitely say have a look at the gRPC project. Yes. Um, it is the default serialization and basically like core interface to gRPC. Uh, we have two episodes that we've talked about it on. Uh, episode number 15, we had uh, Varun Tawal, who is the PM on it. Yep. Um, and we also talked with Brandon Phillips from uh, CoreOS, who talked about how they use it internally as well. Yeah, and they use it a lot. They use it a lot. <laughs> um, so definitely well worth a listen. Um, you can use protocol buffers on their own, but I think combined with gRPC is just a really nice fit. Yeah, and basically gRPC, what it's going to do, it's going to give you, uh, so if protocol buffers defines the messages, uh, gRPC defines the operations that receive mm. and sends those messages. Pretty much. Pretty it's much. kind of a way of seeing it. And since we're talking about protocol buffers, there's also another cool project that I really like and I discovered not that long ago. It's called Flat Buffers. Uh, of course, you've heard about Flat Buffers because video game players, like video game designers love it. Um, yes, I have heard about Flat Buffers. So Flat Buffers are literally a slightly different way of serializing data up and down the pipe. Um, still has an interface definition language. Um, but the thing that makes it different is that the data uh, can be accessed directly without having to parse and unpack it on the other end. Yeah. So basically, I, the, the way I see flat buffers is that in protocol buffers, you need to decode the whole message to get any of the data inside. Mm -hmm. In flat buffers, you can just like, whenever you need that piece of data, you access it directly, which means that you're kind of doing like lazy decoding. And if you have a lot of information and you want to just like start the game now, mm. you can do it. Yeah, so you get just different pros and cons on each yeah. one, on which side that you get the, the, the performance hit on. Um, they both work. The cool thing is if you're using gRPC, you can use flat buffers and you can use protocol buffers. It's nice. really up to you. Awesome. Well, um, I think that's going to wrap up another episode today. Francesc, are you heading off? Uh, I think you're still going to go for Con China? Yes, I'll be in Gopher Con China April 15th and 16th, and I'm planning to do some other things around. Still not have decided, so I will not announce it yet. And afterwards, I'll be on my way to New York. Uh, first week of April, I'll be in New York for internal meetings. So probably I'm going to be planning some Go meetups or Kubernetes meetups, stuff like that. What about you? Um, so as I said before, I'm heading off to Vancouver. Um, I've just had confirmed that I will be speaking at the Vancouver Unity meetup, uh, talking about game servers actually running on Kubernetes, which is loads and loads of fun. Um, and then I'll also be talking at the Polyglot meetup uh, on the 6th as well in Vancouver. Uh, I'll be doing our old favorite Simon Says, talking about gRPC and Kubernetes, nice. strangely enough. Uh, yeah. But after that, uh, later in April, East Coast Game Conference and Vector, I'll be there both places as well. Again, talking about Kubernetes and game servers. I'm having loads of fun there. Well, I think it's time to say goodbye. So thanks again uh, one more week and this 70 weeks in a row. <laughs> thank you for taking the time to record this amazing episode with me. And thank you all out there for listening. Yeah, and Frances, thank you for joining me once again. And we'll see you all next week. See you all next week. 